Cool. Yeah, so one of the things that student data showed when they did a big student survey in the district about online learning was that students found discussion boards to be kind of unhelpful and repetitive. And I think instructors often feel that too. And so Kristen and I were talking about ways that we try and make our discussion boards more engaging and more meaningful for students and also more interesting for us. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. Um, we want to be more like these puppies than like that puppy. So that's my kind of model for which sort of puppy I want to be on my discussion board. So the problem, as you can see, we have it framed here, is that discussion boards on Canvas and anywhere, but usually people are thinking of Canvas, often just feel kind of flat. They feel like busy work to students, according to a lot of student reports. And a lot of times they also feel repetitive, especially in the ways that people respond. And when Kristen and I talked about it, we realized that we have really similar solutions to those problems. So we both try to design discussion boards that prioritize student creativity and student voice. And we found that if the student invests something of their own voice in it, they feel more protective of it. They care about their posts. They care what other people say about it. It just creates this connection that makes them value it and not treat it like busy work. And so we work on ways to try and prioritize student voice while still making it about the class that we're teaching. So we'll craft our discussion board prompts in a personalized way. So they relate to the student, but also to our specific subject. And that makes students feel personally invested in their responses. We wanted to start out, and this might be a little unusual, but we wanted to start out with having you actually try a discussion board out. Most of you have probably done this as a teacher, but you might not have participated in them as a student. So I've set up a discussion board in Canvas and we'll spend about 10 minutes just being students in this experience. I think there's a twofold benefit to this. One is that Canvas changed a little, so it's actually a little bit different to post images and stuff. So this will give you a chance to see how your students are going to experience those changes once school starts. But also we've made a discussion that we think prioritizes student voice. So go on into the Catalyst account, the same place you went to click on the Zoom link, not account, the Catalyst Canvas class is what I meant. So the same place you went to click on the Zoom link for this session. And then if you go in discussions, um, you'll see, I just published a discussion in there called, which plant are you? Um, so go ahead and just do that. I'm going to give us about 10 minutes. Leave Zoom on. I'll call you back when it's time. It wouldn't usually be this quick if you were a student, but we made a quick one. So you should be able to do it in 10 minutes. So I'll see you shortly. And I'm here if you have questions. Kristen is sharing the screen right now what it looks like, but of course you'll need to open it in your own tab.
Hi, Laura. Um, I'll send you a message in the chat explaining that. Oh, I replied to someone else's comment instead of making my own. That is okay. Uh, thanks. This is my first day using Canvas. We still appreciate your response. Okay, so Laura, I sent you a little note on how to fix that issue, but let me know if you still have trouble. Once you've already posted yours, remember you can go apply, uh, reply to other people. So I'm going to give you a three minute warning to finish up. I know that was really fast, my friends, but um, hopefully it gives you a little bit of a sense of what we're going to talk about um, and a little bit of that student experience. So go ahead and like hit post if you're posting and then come on back. And once you are here, we'll just really quickly talk that over a bit. I see some of you popping back. I love your plants, by the way. Whoever it was, I think Christina who said, or maybe it was somebody else, whoever said bristle cone pine. I really, I was like, wait, I wish that was my answer. I just went and saw those over the break or a little bit before. And I was so, they're so amazing and resilient. I think it's more that I want to be like that than that I am like that. <laughs> they're so amazing and they're so old, right? Like they're, I was 
so impressed by them. These are great answers, all of you. It's funny how many of you who I know are lovely think you're prickly. I guess it's just how we see ourselves. Okay, so um, we are gonna go on in just a second, but just a really quick reflection. Did people have trouble with the actual physical posting? Um, was there anything about the question that you think was like easy or hard? Just go ahead and quickly share in the chat if you'd like, or out loud if you want, there's not that many of us. I'll give a minute for that. So there's a couple good thoughts here. One, um, and this is so common, uh, Rachel was saying that it's really easy to hit reply under a classmate. I didn't know that until I was a student in one of these classes either. It is so hard for them to see that they need to just hit reply right under the instructions because they scan and then you see reply everywhere. So that's always something that I say in the instructions is look directly under the instructions and hit reply. Um, so that's a good thing to know. Um, other things like making the instructions sequential is really helpful. Um, so, oh, and some people are asking about some technical things, um, which we'll definitely get at. One thing that I want to note is that this is not the kind of question that you would do in a class just in the sense that this is quicker. I was trying to make it something you could do in 15 minutes, but the model of it works. So you can take this model of which thing are you like that we studied, which thing meets your personality. Um, for example, in my class, they'll study two art movements and then I'll ask them if you were one of these art movements, which one and why? So they have to give details of that art movement and say why they are like that, which shows that they learned it, but they're also self-identifying. And it's this way of self-representing and you know, really focusing on their own voice. So that can work for anything. It can even work for, I know this sounds abstract, but it can work for types of equations or it can work for like principles of philosophy. Are you more of a platonic personality or a Socratic personality? Like there's all kinds of ways you can do this and it doesn't really matter what they say about who they are. That part is for them to be invested in it and it's fun to read, but it's more about how they're thinking about applying the thing that they learned. Um, Okay, so anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Kristen. You wanna to go to that next slide and talk it through? Yeah, um, so again, just to kind of revisit uh, where we started and what Cara and I discovered as we were thinking through our discussion boards that we did find a lot of overlap in really the principles and the things that we were using to make these discussions uh, more authentic, engaging for both um, ourselves and our students. And so some of the major uh, takeaways were moving away from a very kind of question and answer style that often when I see uh, discussion boards from fellow instructors that seem frustrated with responses, that it's often here's a reading or here's a chapter and here's five questions, respond to those questions and then respond to three or four peers. And then that's where we start to get a lot of the you get the initial post and they've answered the questions, but then you get a lot of, oh, I agree with you, or you're completely right, uh, because they feel like they've already covered that or they've they've responded in very similar ways. Uh, and so if we can open up the discussions to really be more student driven, allow the students more agency in things like applying the information in different ways, like you took the plants and then you applied that to your own lives and experiences, allowing for some sort of creativity and personalization, um, allowing for a lot of open-ended and allowing it to go places that you may not be able to 100% dictate, but that might allow for a lot of opportunity uh, to discover concerns from students or ideas or personalities of various students. Uh, and then also allowing for self-representation, which really builds on that humanizing that we try to complete in that first couple weeks of class, um, that these discussion boards continue to do that. Uh, from here, I'm gonna share a couple of uh, discussion boards that I created last semester. Uh, I do use, so these aren't strictly discussion boards because I use a lot of different discussion tools. Um, so I use things like Padlet and Google Slides as discussion platforms. 
uh, but I, what I'll show you could certainly apply to a traditional discussion board as well. So really it's more about the principle and the setup and kind of the, the direction, the foundation that you could use really in any type of platform with students. Um, so the first thing I'm going to share with you is, is a Padlet assignment and I have provided, you can embed these in uh, Canvas so students can easily access them. They don't have to log into someplace else. They can just do all of the work inside Canvas. And um, I, I've provided embedding instructions uh, in the Canvas shell for today under our presentation as well, if you're curious about that. Um, so the first one is a, a Padlet discussion and just to review and uh, from the English perspective that often our discussions are based in some sort of reading or concept um, and then students are responding and discussing that reading either content or form. Uh, so doing uh, both of those activities. So this first one is just an example um, of uh, taking a concept for this one. It's a video. So we were talking about satire um, and the benefits of satire. So they watched a, a brief TED talk on why satire is important. Uh, and then again, rather than having them complete an activity where it's identify the central argument or what pick out this or, or kind of having these questions that it's really more about students looking at it and sharing their observations. So in the instructions, uh, students had to pull out two um, specific points. I didn't ask them to respond to or explain the points that they pulled out. These students actually just naturally did that, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, that when I'm allowing them to kind of pull things out and they don't necessarily have to explain it, that they're kind of um, providing that explanation anyway. And then create two open-ended questions. So the students are actually generating those questions on their own. And I specifically tell them not to answer them yet, which is sometimes a little disorienting at first. Uh, but then the responses to each other are based in these questions that they've created rather than questions that I've created. So then this allows, I think, for uh, students not to be looking for correct answers but to be exploring and engaging in open conversation and dialogue. Um, and then again, this is just how that would appear in Canvas with the video and then the Padlet at the bottom. And again, you could certainly do this in the same way with a traditional discussion board. Uh, from there, I'll just share some of the uh, responses from students just to get an idea of how this conversation plays out. And these are just little snippets uh, from the, the Padlet from last semester. And so I noticed that, you know, the questions were actually really thought provoking. I think sometimes we are fearful of when we allow students to create questions, are they going to go as deeply as we um, hope that they will? Uh, and so this student asked if cartoons are meant to be thought provoking, why would the artist add emotions into the drawing when they know that when people feel emotions, their judgment tends to decrease. And if we look at the responses, we don't get agreement or disagreement because they're responding to a question. So, um, you know, we get for your first question, this brought me back to how different news medias lean a particular way. So the students uh, choosing to explore um, media bias that we've, we've thought about in class. Uh, the next person asks uh, or responds with the second question in my opinion is, um, this artists put their own emotions and opinions in them to show controversy on the topic. So we're really getting a lot of, of genuine and authentic perspective uh, in these responses and um, as similar responses as we move over uh, into these other questions. Um, so why are we afraid of making somebody angry? So they're asking some really, really interesting um, things with these open-ended questions. Again, these questions are coming from uh, their outlook and their perspective on the text and not necessarily trying to seek to uh, find the correct answer for my myself. Um, the next one is a, a Google slide approach. And again, you can take this foundation and really apply that to a, a discussion board as well. This one was less about um, a, questions and more, this was a little bit more content generation and uh, students are kind of creating some responses and thoughts. Um, and then, so once you've completed uh, the text, I asked them to, first of all, with these things, they do need to include their uh, name, uh, but I had them determine a significant trend and this is just specific to where we were going, but there were multiple ways that they could have taken this uh, response. And then um, they locate, um, a quote that they felt was important for them to think through uh, the chapter. And again, these are, these are open-ended. I'm not looking for specific 
uh, responses. And then um, adding an image. And this is really, I think, the key point and going back to what we had you guys do at the beginning of uh, this presentation is that students are actually applying that knowledge in new and different ways. And so by selecting a quote that we're not getting the quote over and over again, but then also by selecting a quote and then having them tie it to an outside image, now students are having to really kind of think through that image um, in new and different ways. And so you're getting new interpretations from each and every student because they're seeking and seeing different things. And so we're, we're getting that personalization and creativity. Um, and then a, a brief explanation of how that quote and image connect. So again, it's not simply responding to that, that quote, but it's thinking about that connection between the image where we get a lot of those really um, unique responses. Um, and I can answer some of the questions on the Padlet and everything uh, in a second, because I, I see those coming up. Uh, so definitely um, as we're moving forward. And then I just wanted to share what this looks like, because I think it's really cool to see how students take um, this type of discussion format and what things they do. I thought this one was really impactful to me, the way that they applied images, um, because we were talking about um, Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, a chapter from that text, and to see how they were applying uh, the chapter that was specifically on the criminalization of the black body and see how they were taking um, that essentially uh, trend and, and persistent trend um, and thinking about it and how they were interpreting it in images. Um, and then again, kind of thinking through some of the responses that we're getting uh, that then as students are replying, and I think this is really that, that step that sometimes things get a little bit maybe boring for us is when students are simply replying with those, I agree, disagree. Um, so we get more of these observations on what each student is doing in their responses. So the image is pretty interesting. The distortion uh, seems to be related to misconceptions. So they're really kind of trying to, to take that out and respond in their own ways. And then it's not just I agree, we get some of that, but I agree with your analysis because, and then we get more explanation because there's really more to unpack, unpack in each of the student responses. Um, and then same thing here. And we're getting a lot of really in-depth responses to, to each of the students' explanations. We really get a lot of really critical thinking as they're applying it um, outside of the, the text themselves. So those are really just a couple of, um, samples of things that I've completed in class. And again, these are things that I do. And I think one of the questions uh, was, uh, why? what's the benefit of using Padlet for me personally over using a traditional discussion board or using uh, a Google slide assignment versus a traditional uh, discussion board? Um, I feel that they're more, for me, Personally, they're more visually engaging. And I think there's something about having that visual platform that inherently kind of helps students engage in the discussion a little bit differently. Um, Pilot also offers a lot of different um, formatting options. They have one that's a column option that I really like. So if you're maybe comparing or have students uh, discussing two separate texts, that then you might have here's text one, here's text two, and then they do things in each of those columns. Um, and so there's there's different ways that you can engage with that. And I also think that we were mentioning that repetitiveness in the discussion boards. And so by creating things that are visually different, then it feels less repetitive to students. Um, and by embedding it, and I think that's really essential. And I did, I didn't mention this in the last one, um, but I did figure out actually how to um, how to embed a Google slide so that you'll notice that the slideshow that they're adding to is actually embedded in the bottom of the assignment. And they can click on this and go to the, the full uh, Google slide. But I have noticed that by having it embedded, there's really um, no excuse <laughs> to not get there, right? Unless there's something that's happening to the document. And then of course that's out of their hands, that's out of my hands um, and just addressing how to fix it. But having it embedded uh, really helps with that as well. So my standpoint on why I use these tools over, um, and I do use some activities, I do still use the more traditional discussion board, um, but that I feel the visual difference 
allows for for better engagement and different differentiation between um, between assignments. And then I, I can curate some of those questions for you, Kristen, because yeah. I've been keeping an eye on it. So <laughs> folks were wondering if you pay for Padlet or if you're using the free one. Um, I actually do pay for Padlet. I decided just personally, I decided that um, it was worth it to me um, because it allows for that differentiation and allowed me to do some things that I feel like I can't do in the discussion board. But again, I feel like you can do a lot of the conceptually, you could do the exact same activities that I went through with these two documents in a traditional discussion board on Canvas as well, that the concept yeah. could absolutely still be there. Right, so you can keep it simpler and free or yeah. branch out. And some of it's about keeping you interested too, right? As the instructor, so you're not always looking <laughs> at the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, I'm really in love with the column on Padlets that that has been really beneficial. So for me personally, I just felt like it was worth that cost. The thing that I have found, and this gets at some of the other questions and comments people were making, is that if you have a really good question, like if the question is well designed, it doesn't really matter what you use, you know, and all of the different specifics about how do I get students to reply, you're worried that they won't necessarily reply. Um, if it's a good question, they will usually. I mean, there's always someone who's not going to do the work, but generally speaking, I think it's driven by the really exciting, engaging prompt. And the more that's there, the more students will just do it, um, usually. Um, so that's been my experience. Has that been yours, Kristen? Uh, yeah, but I think if they're in this creation and they're engaged in the text that you're assigning and they're, they are providing their own perspective and you, you've created discussion boards that value their perspective. I think that's the biggest thing that then they want to respond to one another that I had many cases with these classes and those discussion boards that I was showing you where students were doing more responses than the required three. So yeah. that it was really more about being involved in that discussion that they wanted to be participating because they were providing their own perspective. So I think that that's how you, and of course it's not perfect. You're always gonna have students that are missing it, right? And that's why that flexibility is, is there, but that you get more excitement behind it, absolutely. Yeah, and there's that thing of like, you know, we're all like a little obsessed with ourselves, right? So if you're if you're making it about you, then you care about what people have to say about it. And then you want to engage with, you know, what you've learned about your classmates in a more authentic way, right? So it's that like, we're leveraging people's narcissism um, <laughs> to make them be more invested in the whole process, um, I think. Maybe that's like a negative way to say it, but um, it seems to work. <laughs> Um, so I think that we, so we have a couple other things here to potentially go over or show you, but if you don't mind, Kristen, I kind of think we might take a minute to like get at some of the things that have been coming up in the chat, just kind of yeah. casually. Yeah. Absolutely. So there's a couple of, um, like technical questions here about how to just manage the discussion boards. And I think that that's really useful to talk about just with all of us since we've all probably used them in some way. One question that came up early on was about the threaded discussion option. So I'm not sure if we set it up that way in the Catalyst site since I didn't set up Catalyst, but um, in your discussion board, usually you can like pick threaded, enable threaded discussion. Um, so Jason was asking earlier what people think about that. Um, what's been, I always do it. What's been your experience, Kristen? Um, you know, I'm actually not entirely sure what that means. Does that mean like that you do allow those replies versus not allowing replies on post? It allows more replies. That's all. So instead of it being just showing a few, it shows like a whole list of replies. So you can kind of reply endlessly. Um, I always do it. I always allow it. I'm not sure why people don't. I think maybe if you don't check it, um, it could keep it more manageable and you don't get those long lists of replies. I don't know what's, um, feel free for others to speak up um, about your experience with that threaded button. I what feel you... like there is, sorry, I interrupt. I feel like there's, um... a benefit in encouraging students to disperse their replies 
so has and everybody's replying to those the same posts yeah um whereas if you encourage students make sure that if some has a ton of posts then move to a post that doesn't have necessarily me it doesn't feel super over various threads but i could see how that would be um yeah be difficult yeah. yeah I think you were cutting out a little bit there in your audio but I think that um it's just what you're saying so it limits it to like three replies or something and so you see a longer list of replies I always check the threaded discussion thing by default like Katie was saying because I figure you know you want students to be able to go back and forth um so yeah Jason or anybody else who was curious about that that tends to be my perspective on it I, I haven't heard anyone say why they like to not enable it so um, I didn't unless I, go ahead, Danica. I didn't, I didn't realize that you could not, um, have it be threaded. It's always <laughs> thread. I mean, like threaded is the structure, but they have that yeah. button that says threaded or not. And it just means like more posts. Right. Yeah. It's always that same structure though, of like, uh, like an old fashioned chat room, right. Where you're like replying to right. a regular post. Um, yeah. So. I think that I'm with Katie on this in the chat. I think that threaded like should be the default, honestly. I don't know why it isn't. Yeah. Um, and then the other big question that was coming up in here um, was just about how you manage getting people to respond to the right things. So that has been a problem like for me and for everybody that I talk to that like some people post early and everyone responds to those people. Um, I have found, so I do one of these very personalized ones every week in my discussion classes. And I found that by like week four, people have found a group of people who they relate to and they wait for them to post and they respond to each other. So it takes a little time, but they'll tend to kind of clump. That might not happen though in classes that are, like I teach art classes. So there's a little bit more like, oh, these people are my style. So I'm gonna stick with them. That might not happen in your biology class or your chemistry class. Um, so one option that works okay is in your instructions, you can say, look for someone who hasn't had a response yet and respond to them. That does work. Um, Kristen, what do you do for that? Um, I, I just offer, encourage them to respond to uh, ones that haven't been responded to. I think you always get a few of those last minute posts that students don't respond to as much, but it does seem like they are dispersed a little bit more. Um, and I think that ties to making sure that students uh, complete them early so that they can respond. Um, something that I did this semester with my asynchronous classes was I had morning deadlines instead of midnight deadlines. So I did like a 9.30 a.m. Uh, morning deadline and that seemed to help students stay on top of that work a little bit more effectively. I think in getting it done early that they were more students, of course you had some that were doing it in the morning, but more students were doing it in the evening before. Other yeah, that's a good thought. I see you Danica. Um, when, so one other thing to, to note about that deadlines, you can also put in a note that says, this is the deadline for your post, but you have 24 hours to post your replies. Um, that's what I usually do and that, that goes okay too. Okay, go ahead, Danica. Uh, one of the things that I found that students get really annoyed by and i know that this annoys me i don't know about you guys but i have my um, notifications for my email set to to ding every time they go off but canvas sends an outrageous amount of notifications to students um, with the uh, discussion boards so literally every single person that's posting and then all of the replies as well um, and I, I, I wish that there was a way to, to like, um, reply to, to set up notifications that were more like highly specified, you know, like, like if I, if there was, you know, can I pick somebody's name out to like, uh, you know, have, have it set up, you know, just the way you would normally in a discussion thread where you can call somebody by name instead of having it just automatically give whatever notifications constantly um, because then I, I feel like people get uh, discussion fatigue. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but um, 
but I've definitely heard that feedback from students and it, even students who are, are really good at engaging um, the, the chat uh, or the discussion, but just get burnt out on it after, you know, after a little while. And yeah. Have that. I mean, I think that you can just have them turn it completely off and then, you know, turn off their discussion notifications. That's what I did as a student. And then I just would look at it. So I yeah. would just go back and look. I think that's what a lot of them do. Um, I just shared a video for how to adjust the notifications, but it doesn't personalize. You can't be like, I only want Ari's notifications. Or I only want Danica's, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, I know. I, go ahead. I, I unsubscribe immediately after doing them now. So, so yeah, but I know that then um, some students who might actually engage are not engaging because of that. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is an issue. Christina, do you have something to add about it? Uh, no, I haven't really experienced that problem. And it's probably because I use a lot of these other tools so that it doesn't work in the same sort of notification way. Um, but again, I change having students change the notifications so they aren't getting those constant that constant bombardment. Because I think that's also problematic for when you're sending legitimate updates and announcements to students from Canvas that you don't want them to be so overwhelmed so that they do pay attention to those things that are important. Right. Um, so definitely making sure that they have them set up the way that you want them set up. Yeah. Um, Christina Crosby had her hand raised there. I'm just gonna add a comment because um, I felt the, the same way. I actually tell students in the orientation to turn, I tell them what notifications they should leave on and what they should turn off and I tell them to turn off the discussion boards. Yep. Um, but something that I do, um, like I like the idea, I never did um, what Christian said of the morning due date and then you have like time in the afternoon. I kind of like that, I might try that out. Uh, but I would set, you would set the date for the initial posting. And then something that I started doing because you don't, you can't in Canvas create a second like reminder, if you will, on the assignment to reply. Um, I just put in a, a quiz in the modules that's kind of in line of so that they don't forget and I mentioned in the announcement and it's just a quiz that says, did you respond to people? And it's like, yes or no, it's not graded, but it's like serves as a reminder, they have to go through that quiz and they have to actually click, yes, I responded or not. Now they could lie, they could say, yes, I responded and they didn't. But for most students, they just need that reminder. Um, and I find that that's an easy way to just insert it and get them back on those discussion boards. Yeah, that's a good, I never thought of doing that. So that's a great tip, um, making it like a quick, and it's one of the self-graded like quick quiz questions. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I guess you could also um, do it in a Canvas Studio video, like the, the little, like you have to watch the video that reminds you and shows you how to respond and then answer questions saying, yes, I responded. You know how you can add quiz questions. That could be interesting. Yeah, so that's, I like those ideas. Um, the other thing that, that has been coming up a lot, I've been keeping one eyeball on this chat, is about feedback, which Kristen and I actually have different approaches to. Um, so that's worth talking about. So Kristen, how do you deal with um, feedback and discussions? Yeah, so um, I would love to, to talk about that because I think that's something that I maybe do a little bit differently. Um, all of my activities in class activities are based on a complete or incomplete basis. Um, and I don't, with the discussion boards, I really am just looking for thoughtful engagement in the discussion board. And to students, that's a little vague at first, but it's, you know, were you there? Were you present? Did you complete your initial post, follow, you know, did you select the quote, et cetera? You did the pieces and then you responded to, to fellow students. If they did those things, I see that they've done it. I see their name, then they get that complete. Um, I don't sit down and respond to, because I have just so many discussions with all of the readings and everything that I don't sit down and respond to every single student. But what I will do is I'm actually in the discussion boards participating, which for me feels a lot more authentic as it would in class. So that it's more like as if I were going around the classroom, engaging and pulling things out so that I'll respond to, and I can even show an example in this kind of first slide where you see down here that I know um, that, you know, there's a nice question on this poster and I would also add this, or sometimes I'll respond to the whole thread of discussions and think, wow, this was really engaging, pull out a particular comment. Um, and then the only tricky part about that is that I want to make sure that each time I'm responding, I'm responding to different students. So then I'm not responding to the same students every time I'm in a discussion board. Uh, but that's really how I'm providing the feedback and then encouraging students I think this also encourages students to return to the larger discussion board 
rather than just look at my comments and then move on, check it off their list. And so actually engage in the activity and then see that I'm engaging in that activity and I'm part of the community and not sort of this outside grader. So that's really how I approach it, that I'm just looking for, were they involved in the discussion? They get credit for that. And then I'm participating in that to help the class as a whole progress forward through these discussions. Um, so that's really how I personally um, approach it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a really good way because they know you're in there and then you can keep track if you enable the notes section in your gradebook, um, you can write down like, okay, I responded to these two week one, these two week two, and then you make sure you're not always responding to the same person or, you know, everybody at some point gets a response. I'm a little bit different because um, and my classes are just giant. You know, I have five sections, they're usually 40 to 50 each. And so it gets quite overwhelming. And so what I'll do is I, I don't go into the discussion board at all. Instead, I'll just leave feedback through the gradebook. So I go through in the grade book and I'll let them see that I read it. So, you know, I make some specific kind of comment and I don't go crazy with it. I sort of leave them to discuss, but then I'll, I'll scan it and say like, oh, I love that one comment you made about the complimentary colors, or you said such a smart thing to Rihanna, like that was so, you know, observant of you. So I'll just make one targeted comment for each person in the grade book so they know I'm reading it. And then, um, and this is a little bit cheating, but it works for me. I'll in weeks where I feel like I cannot stay like really in, you know, enough of the discussion to show that I'm there, I'll send out an announcement featuring one person's reply. So I'll look through and say like, okay, here's this little bit that looks really good. And then I'll just send an announcement saying, did you notice that Christina like shared this really cool image and then got into this nice conversation about it and this relates to what we're doing. So go check that out. So I think by doing that, they kind of have this idea that I'm watching. <laughs> so those are my cheats for like having 200 students per semester. Yeah. But I think Kristen's way is better, honestly. I just don't feel like I can do it. <laughs> and it's not, I will add that it's not like I put super in-depth comments in engagement, but it's just noting. But I think the most important thing is that the students know that you're there and that you're seeing the conversation and that you're responding to it in some way. Um, so that they understand that what they've done is productive and meaningful and not, again, just busy work, that you're actually seeing it, even if it's, it's more of a perception of you really kind of reading through. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. So in the, so Laura and Danica are having this conversation in the chat about like just getting people to reply. And even if you send out announcements and you model it and you can make a video, I mean, a video is always good. I mean, there is the thing of, there's always gonna be some people who just aren't doing it, you know? Like, so I think that like, you gotta give yourself like 2% of students who just are not gonna read the instructions no matter how you do it and kind of let that go. But for the majority, Giving the feedback in either way that Kristen and I are talking about puts enough pressure on people to know the teacher is looking. And then also, I really, I know I said this before, but I really think it's about the quality of the questions. Like if the questions really prioritize the student's voice and really show themselves something or show them something about their peers, they're gonna wanna do it. Not just post, but they're gonna wanna read their classmates' posts. Even like, or I would say even more in COVID, like during the time when people have been more isolated, I've seen the replies take off in those more personalized ones because I think people are starved to know each other. You know, there's this thing, and I, I got a lot of feedback about this last semester that students were really enjoying more than usual the personalized discussions because they just weren't ever like making new friends anymore or like making small talk even with people. So it was giving them this opportunity to kind of know each other. So I do think that that can work if, if you, if you kind of like just make an allowance for that couple of students who are just not going to do it no matter what. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Laura's saying using images slides. I think that the visuality of like Kristen's examples or even the thing I had y'all do with the plants, just putting in a picture helps students when they're scanning through, you know, what Danica and Stevie were saying is overwhelming, like these tons and tons of posts. If there's pictures, it, it does help. So your eye grabs on a back cactus that you like, and then kind of like you can go back and look for the cactus again and see who responded. Like there's something about the visuality of it that helps. Um, yes, Stevie. So going off of the idea that you were just talking about of getting students to reply, 
this is kind of a very open-ended question, but I keep thinking about what is our actual purpose of doing discussion boards? And I feel like, you know, back in the day, it was just, it was always, it was really about just having student-student interaction, right? But now I feel like we're trying to make it something more, which I, I'm happy to hear. And so I guess my question is, it, it goes along with the idea of getting students to reply. And it had brought up in the chat about um, students replying last minute. Because I feel like, you know, we talk about discussion, we want to be this back and forth, like throughout the week, like, oh, they talk and they get ideas and they talk again. But in my experience, it's they post at the deadline, they reply at the deadline. And so it feels, it's very asynchronous, which maybe that's just the point. But then I was thinking, so your idea of like having them ask the question and students answer it, that obviously gets a lot more engagement. So I'll try that. Um, but then I guess the, the question is, what are we really expecting from reply posts? Now I say that because, you know, of course I have it in my syllabus that says it can't be, it has to be more than just I like or I don't like. But even when I've done discussion posts, I know the plant one was quick and just a quick example, but again, sometimes I just feel like all I really want to say is like, cool, I agree, which that's not what we want from students. But I feel like, what are we really wanting in the replies? And that's a big question, but just something I've been curious what other people think. Um, I can respond to that because I have a lot of, and to some extent I felt like my assignments got a little overwhelming, but then I think that it was beneficial in that my discussion boards are kind of part of a, a longer series. So that if they're reading a text, that often I would have some sort of individual reading activity that they would submit, like annotations for the reading to see, okay, they've engaged with the text on their own. And then I would respond to that. And then that next step and mostly what I showed you today was more of a content. So how are they engaging with the content? Are they comprehending the content? And um, how are they starting to apply that and think through it so that, that those goals of the discussions I showed you were really about understanding that content. And then that next step, sort of the follow-up would be, there would be another sort of activity or discussion that may or may not include replies, but that would be focused more on structure with like for a writing class, right? I'm thinking first we need to know the content of a piece and then we start to think about the structure of a piece and how are you breaking that down? And so that it's really that process of kind of engaging and understanding with that content in the discussion. And then the next thing, engaging and breaking down that, uh, that structure. And then so it's allowing me it's allowing them to engage in that, but it's also allowing me to see how are they developing this in that discussion and as they're progressing to one another. So I think that reply piece is important for them helping each other understand, like developing it. And I see that a lot in these discussions where it's not so much, they're not agreeing because they're noticing, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Or, oh, maybe it means this so that they're engaging more meaningfully. And that's what I'm hoping to accomplish. And I'm not sure if that quite answers. And I know that's very like English specific, but um, I think that it can kind of fit into other other disciplines as well. No, that helps a lot. And I think a lot of, eventually what I think I'm learning is it's, I think what Kara said, it's the question, right? And like you said, you have it multi-step discussion almost through many applications. That, that's really cool. So thank you. No, that helped a lot. Yeah, so, I think I, oh, you, sorry. Sorry. No. Uh, I was just going to say we're about out of time. We can stick around for a couple minutes, but if anybody needs to go because it's noon, thank you so much for coming. But um, what, if you don't mind, I'll give us like two more minutes for the people who can stay so we can finish this. Cool. Okay. Go ahead, Danica. Oh, Stevie, I was just going to say, uh, you know, being chemistry and physics, I think we have similar um, discipline. So I don't use the discussion board throughout my course, or, or uh, I'll take that back. I use the graded discussion once and only at the beginning. And I've only done that now because of the fact that we're online and I feel like it's the only way to get the students talking to each other right out the gate. Um, I feel like it gives them a support network and gives them an opportunity to meet each other and find things in common so that they can form study groups, stuff like that. Um, so that's really the, the only way that I use discussion boards because I can't manage it throughout the semester. It's just too much. Um, I have discussion forum that I use, uh, which is Discord. So that's my ongoing, which I you know monitor constantly, like ridiculously constantly. Um, but I really find that just getting students talking about what they're afraid of 
in a class um, has been a really hot topic for me uh, because I teach chemistry and I know people come into this class and they're like, oh great, I do not wanna do this, right? So, so getting them to kind of build on um, what they're scared of has been a really um, fruitful topic for me. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to build on that. Well, and I think that's a great point because I think the icebreaker stuff works perfectly, but I think it would be interesting to maybe is a, maybe this discipline a little bit, like you're saying, would be interesting to bring some of the sciences and maths together to talk about as for my asynchronous class, I've, I've struggled with this for years. This is not like new for me. It's just like how to really keep it engaging and like you know, the little tips of like, you know, what plant are you? I wrote down notes myself, like, like what planet are you? What rock are you? Like, I'm going to try that kind of stuff. I think it really will help. But then to really keep that in discussion the entire semester, like you're saying, Danica, is a different ball game altogether. So this is really good to get me started thinking more again. Yeah, Stevie, I highly recommend you check out Discord um, for like a, like a very easy communication device. Um, it's kind of, it, it's similar to, uh, what's the one that Canvas has? Pronto. Pronto. Um, but it's a little more like social media um, in terms of its user, user interface. Um, they can share pictures, they can do audio, like discussions, stuff like that. Um, and I just don't grade it, right? So I, the only thing that I have graded is my front loaded icebreaker. And then everything after that I have um, in my syllabus, I give um, consideration to bumping up a grade if mm. they've been participating basically. So that's my carrot that I dangle, right? Um, and that, that seemed to keep people engage pretty well throughout the semester, so. Well, thank you both. I actually have to run, but thank you. So yeah. It was a great conversation <laughs> starter. Thank you so much. And if anybody wants to keep like, you know, tabs on each other who are in this workshop, I did share a Google Doc that was sort of like a reflection Google Doc, but you can like continue the conversation by commenting on each other's posts if you want. So the Google Doc is in there if you'd like, if you, especially if you don't already know each other, then you can exchange information if you want to collaborate. Um, but thanks so much to everybody for coming. Thanks for um, taking the time in this busy week. And anything else to say, Kristen? Uh, no, that's it. Thank okay. you all so Great. much. Good seeing y'all. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Donna. Hello. One of the things we didn't talk about is who's going to be sharing their screen. Do you want me to share? Do you want to share? Oh, yeah, you're sharing because you are so much better at it than I am. Um, <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. That's a low bar. <laughs>